Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Felicia Oladenu, and I'm the co-champion for CSU Global's Enlightening Talks. Thank you for joining us. I am pleased to welcome you to the Colorado State University Global Campus Enlightening Talk Series. Tonight's program is titled, What Makes a Successful Criminal Justice Professional? As we get started, I wanted to remind you that CSU Global is committed to the foundational principles of academic freedom. As such, any speaker presenting material through enlightening talks also has freedom to express his or our own views, which do not necessarily reflect the views of CSU Global. Thank you, Felicia. I'm Dr. Michael Skiba, and I have the pleasure of having Dr. Rebecca Rivera here with us uh, this evening. I'd just like to give you a brief overview of CSU Global, our program, some of the things we're doing in criminal justice. First of all, CSU Global, we, we started in 2007, uh, and we are the, the first uh, independent 100% online university uh, in the United States, so we take, uh, we take pride in that. Um, our focus, uh, our student population is on working adults and, uh, and modern learners. Uh, we offer uh, bachelor's uh, degrees, master's degrees, uh, and many different certification uh, programs. Uh, and we also take pride that we, we operate without any state funding. Um, so, uh, you know, our, our tuition, our, our revenue is basically driven through our, uh, through our tuition. We have nearly 19,000 uh, current students in our population, uh, and that is growing uh, at an exciting level. Um, so, you know, we understand that while traditional college uh, meets the needs of a certain segment of the population, um, you know, the, the, the general student profile is changing to include non-traditional students. Uh, and those non-traditional students have different needs and expectations. Uh, and that's really what we, uh, what we focus on. Um, you know, we know that, you know, the research tells us that about 75% of all post-secondary students are now non-traditional. Uh, so we really want to focus uh, on meeting the needs of those, uh, those students. On a CSU Global, um, we have successfully built uh, a, a industry-leading higher education uh, philosophy and mindset uh, to engage those students uh, for future uh, success in their chosen careers. So we are, uh, you know, at CSU Global, uniquely positioned uh, in the higher education uh, industry. You know, our business model is very flexible, uh, and we're, we're very supportive of a modern, forward-thinking institution. Uh, which allows us to, to utilize and, and build upon uh, and leverage many of our uh, many of our talents. So, just some statistics uh, from CSU Global: 65% uh, of our students are undergraduate, 40% uh, are uh, first generation, 28% uh, are um, identified as racial and ethnic minorities, 15% uh, are active uh, military, dependent, guard, reserve, or, or veteran. Uh, so, we love to support our. Uh, active military uh, students. Uh, students represent every state uh, and territory uh, in over 50 countries. So we definitely have a global reach and, and we, take, uh, we take pride in that. Uh, average student is 35 years old, married uh, and with, uh, with children. So a little bit about our criminal justice program. Um, so we offer two, uh, we offer bachelor's and master's programs. Uh, we have five undergraduate specializations and two graduate specializations. Uh, so our specializations include fraud management, emergency management, homeland security, criminal justice management, uh, and criminology. So um, we really, really um, are, are focused on, on those, those fine-tuned areas of the industry uh, to help our students uh, succeed. And we, we, we also, um, you know, our program is very dynamic and inter interactive. So there's, uh, there's many different components to it. So we have a, a, a personalized learning platform. So for example, in, in almost all of our classes, we have uh, personalized videos. Um, and those, those are focused on two different areas. We have um, certain videos that, that cover uh, more generic topics uh, in criminal justice, such as the, the criminal justice components. Uh, but then we also have videos that focus on specific content. Uh, for example, in our, uh, in our uh, forensic psychology course, you know, we talk about body language and we have videos that explain some of the most difficult uh, areas and uh, content in that course. 
Um, we also focus on interactive learning. Uh, so we, we really like to, to make our classes a, a you know, fun, interactive place to be. So we use uh, gamification, uh, drag and drops, timelines. You know, we really try to immerse the students uh, in that particular topical area um, and, and really create that, uh, that relevant atmosphere. So again, it's not just reading text, it's, it's really immersing themselves in the, uh, in the topic. Um, industry relevance, you know, we understand all of our faculty are highly credentialed in their respective industries, um, and we bring that right to the course room. So we have direct ties to many of the, the leading professional industry groups uh, in the country and in the world, actually, and we, we, we've aligned and created very strategic partnerships uh, with those, uh, those agencies. And we brought that right into the classroom. So we take those, those principles, for example, in our emergency management, homeland security specialization, we have an exclusive partnership with FEMA. And uh, what, what we've done is we, we've actually taken their coursework and integrated that into our courses. Uh, so, so what happens when the students graduate from that program, they not only get a degree uh, with a specialization in, in emergency management or homeland security, uh, but they also have those FEMA courses uh, you know, to put on their resume. Uh, and also qualify to take some additional certification. So we really want to make it an additional added value beyond uh, the degree that they're going to be earning. Um, and, and lastly, a sense of community. You know, we understand in, in criminal justice, actually in CSU Global in general, um, you know, to really promote our community interaction. Um, so for example, we have uh, newsletters. We have an internal newsletter. Uh, we also have an external alumni newsletter. Uh, we have a criminal justice alumni association uh, where we reach out and connect to those that have graduated uh, and we include them back in the program. You know, we, we, we provide them with updates, things we're doing at the course and curriculum level. Um, you know, and also, you know, we look for feedback from them too on things that they're seeing and hearing in their respective industries. Um, we also have an honor society, criminal justice honor society. And, uh, you know, we take pride in, uh, in looking to leverage those, those partnerships uh, and also uh, with different, uh, different companies directly. So we have uh, very strategic partnerships with many affiliates, uh, both, uh, you know, both in public and private sector. Uh, and and we, we work together with those uh, agencies to create, you know, that, those dynamic learning uh, platforms directly from the, the industry. So uh, again, uh, criminal justice program, we, we have, uh, you know, kind of a multi-pronged approach, um, you know, we leverage digitalization and, uh, you know, different areas there. Um, so, uh, you know, definitely, uh, definitely excited to move forward with our, with our programs. So, um, I would now, I'm very honored to, to, reduce, uh, to introduce our featured speaker for tonight, uh, Dr. Rebecca Rivera. Uh, and before I turn it over uh, to, uh, to Dr. Rivera, um, I would just like to introduce her topic. She's going to be talking about the non-negotiables, uh, competitive qualifications, and passion. Uh, so what makes a cr successful criminal justice professional? That's the topic uh, that, that uh, Dr. Rivera is going to be discussing. Uh, so just to give you a little background um, on our featured speaker. So Dr. Rivera has lived in Denver, uh, Colorado, since 1992, obtained her Bachelor of Arts from U University of Denver, uh, her master's degree in public administration with a concentration on gender-based violence from the University of Colorado. Uh, recent co recently completed her doctor of education from Creighton University, so congratulations. Thank you. Uh, her, research her research focuses on ways in which the criminal justice system can reduce victimization and recidivism through higher education. Um, Dr. Rivera spent over 20 years in law enforcement, first working for the Department of Justice and for the 18th Judicial District Probation Department working as a senior domestic violence probation officer and instructor uh, in motivational interviewing for the state court administrator's office. Um, she's currently working to help create the first young adult program uh, for the Denver district, attorney, district attorney's office. Uh, she's been an affiliate professor for the Metropolitan State University of Denver since 2007. And Dr. Rivera's passion and purpose in life is to empower others through education and awareness. So very, very excited to have Dr. Rivera here. Uh, this this evening. Uh, and now I place you in capable hands of uh, Dr. Rivera. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for that uh, welcome, that warm welcome. And again, thank you, PSU uh, Global, for allowing me to be able to speak tonight. I'm very excited to be here um, getting my slides. So uh, a little bit about me, I always like uh, the personal aspect or the fun facts. 
I look up to Vince Lombardi. Uh, he was a heart-driven leader, if you're not familiar with him. And he really gave me the um, permission to be a heart-driven leader and to be compassionate. And I look at athletics and I look at what he did for athletics. And uh, I thought, you know, if he can do that in that field, we can certainly value the um, power of heart-driven leaders in law enforcement and not look at that as a weakness. Um, I'm off, obviously de very dedicated to the change in, in the way in which we reform men and women through the system. We have a very high recidivism rate in the United States and that bothers me. That bothers me because I'm in the criminal justice field and I want to see a difference. And so I uh, have spent my entire career in academic um, pathway and looking at ways in which we can reform men and women in our system for good uh, to sustain change. Uh, being an affiliate professor and a criminal justice worker uh, is the best of both worlds. I'll talk about passion tonight. Um, both have driven me um, beyond all to exceed any expectation I had of myself. Um, and, uh, and I'll really talk about when I think about working in the best of both worlds, I'll really touch on that when we talk about um, passion. So <clears throat> when you look at, when I was asked to do this presentation, I thought about what could I impart tonight that you haven't already heard? You know, you, you know to have integrity and responsibility and reliability and, and you're always given all of these skills. Um, and I, so I thought I wanted you to have a takeaway of some areas that maybe we don't do are enough to make sure that you're thinking about other skills that are extremely important that sometimes fall under the scope of what we prepare students for or you know people who are starting to enter into the field. Um, so I did want to focus tonight on non-negotiables, meaning what you absolutely should have um, based on my experience um, and just what I've seen in the field so far. Uh, I also want to talk about competitive qualifications. Uh, it, you know, and it's just not enough to have an education. And I know that comes kind of strange coming from an educator, but there needs to be more than just um, education, and we'll talk about that tonight. And, um, and passion and how much that fuels your drive to be in this field. So getting right into uh, what I wanted to talk about this evening is uh, a non-negotiable being your communication skills. I think in a time when we text and we email I, I'm, I always am afraid that we're going to lose the ability to communicate with each other. And as much as we're writing a lot in text and email, it's almost its own form of language. It is so important uh, when you're entering into this field that you have very strong written ab ab abilities to, to communicate it through the written word. Um, what you read or what you write is read by many. Uh, you could write a police report that um, the district attorney is going to read, the defense counsel is going to read, a judge is going to read, a victim. If it's a high-profile case, the, your you know, report might be published by the media. Uh, your writing and what you express through your writing is your credibility. So you really want to write well. Now, I know in school, we always, you know, when I was a high school teacher, there's always always this emphasis on the five paragraph essay. And as much as it's important to write a, fair, a, a five paragraph essay, we write differently in the criminal justice field. Uh, we write as we're technical writers. And so you're never gonna see this police report that says, you know, you're driving down the street on a bright and sunny day and you're passing the blossoming tulips and then you saw a speeding car. Uh, we write very concise and it's very technical. And I notice as I've been an educator, <laughs> some students are really afraid to break away from that traditional form of writing and to write technically. And so I really encourage you to make sure you're taking classes that prepare you for that. How do you write a police report or a probation report uh, so that you're getting used to technical writing? Technical writing is chronological. Um, it's from the minute you have contact with someone to the, to the end of your contact with them. It's a narrative. It should be very detailed. Um, and, and, and if you think about those things, in law enforcement, we do have a model that if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. And so it's your form of being able to justify your interaction with someone or what you did. It's really, really important. You know, there are times in my career 
where I'm like, oh, I'll never forget that this happened. I'll write it later. But then a couple days pass, a couple experiences pass, and then I forget what um, I was supposed to remember. And so really write it down, it, it's, it's extremely important. And so your written skills are very important, spelling, capitalization, periods. I see those missing often in police reports and um, it makes me um, question the credibility of the person. So really make sure you're, you have those good writing skills. When you look at communication skills, we think of verbal skills, and this is the part I don't want us to lose as we advance with technology. You know, I love to text. <laughs> My um, son will tell me, you never answer your phone, but I can always text you, and I'm kind of known to never answer my phone. But um, So I'm just as guilty as everybody else. But we can't lose the ability to communicate with others. Uh, it's just so important to keep that skill, to um, build that skill. In any given day in your career, you could be speaking to a judge, a district attorney, you might speak to a police officer, a correctional officer, defense counsel, uh, you are going to have conversations with someone who's addicted to a drug, you might speak to a victim who's afraid of the system, a person who's resentful of law enforcement, and you have to be able to have this ability to make sure you can speak to them equally um, and honor them and their position in which they present to you. And so when you think about your, your, your ability to speak, there's a couple things that you need to remember. One-on-one -on -one conversations is the way you build trust and rapport with a person. So if you're a probation or parole officer, or diversion officer, uh, if that person doesn't trust you, if that person doesn't understand that you're really there to help them and they don't see your authentic self, they're not gonna open up to you. And the way they start to see that is through communication. So one-on-one -on -one conversations are so important to have, especially if you're more in the community corrections field where you're working one-on-one -on -one with clients on a, on a daily basis. Uh, I also think it's important to listen to understand. <clears throat> I know we listen to respond. I know we listen to gather information but we really need to listen to understand a person's just what that person's bringing to the table uh, we work with a lot of clients and i'll say this a couple times who are pretty broken uh, they're coming to our field for a reason and to listen to understand is significant in your being able to respond and help with reformation that is meaningful or rehabilitation that is meaningful and authentic to that person when you have good communication skills, you're able to negotiate. Uh, you might have to de-escalate someone who's very upset with you. Obviously in law enforcement, not everybody's happy to see you. Um, and uh, they may be angry, they may be afraid. And having the skills to speak to them is really important. It actually can save your life when you think about de-escalating someone who's really upset with you. Uh, I'll also talk about this a great deal tonight, about empathizing, how much your nonverbals and communication, even the written, whatever you're speaking, um, conveying a message of empathy uh, is, is really undervalued, I believe, but it's extremely powerful in our field um, to gain that rapport, to gain that trust with, with um, people who are involved in the system. You know, resiliency is kind of a term that's come up in the past couple of years for me as a teacher, that we should be teaching more about resiliency. So it's more on my radar than it used to be. Although I think that this is a skill, you know, we've been, we've hopefully been training on as far as law enforcement professionals go. Uh, resiliency is defined by Marion Whipster as the ability to find a way to process through and recover from um, adversity. And so it's the capacity to recover strong. And what I think is more wise, if you're learning from your mistakes or you're learning from experiences and you're taking it to heart, you should recover more wise. Uh, it's the ability to adapt to stress when you think about this field. Um, even if you're a victim advocate and you're there to help people, there's still, you know, secondary trauma that happens because you're exposed to their trauma and, and to the things that they're going through. And so you have to find a way to adapt to that stress at work, um, especially because it's for your own health, but also because you don't want to take that home. You don't want to take that home to your family. You want to be yourself. You want to be happy. And so adapting to stress and the things that go on at work uh, is part of that resiliency. This is not an easy job all the time. I don't know if it's ever an easy job, 
I don't know if any jobs are easy, but this job can be particularly difficult. And so that resiliency is, you know, this was a tough day. This was really a tough experience for me to, to endure, but tomorrow's a new day. I've learned from this and, and, and it's all about the recovery. Uh, I hope we're doing a better job as academic professionals uh, and parents and mentors to say that, you know, your failure, failure has to happen. Uh, we have to be in an environment where we allow failure to occur because it's a very important way for you to get a form of feedback on how to do things differently. I think the reason I became good as a probation officer was because of the times that I failed. Um, those seem to be the best lessons for me. And even as a parent, as a person, as a friend, the times that I failed the most uh, is the feedback that made me a better person, a better parent, a better professional. And so that's a part of resiliency is to see failure differently. Um, it's not the end of the world. You're not going to, um, it's just not the end of the world and to learn from it and move forward. And that move forward is really important because you're role modeling behaviors for people involved in the system. So if you're asking someone, you know, who's left prison <clears throat> to move forward and to move forward from their experiences, you also need to role model that through your own behavior. And that's a really important, you know, skill to remember that what you're doing is not only just important for you as a professional, but as a role model to people who desperately need it, and you may be their only role model. I also think resiliency is finding balance and self-care. Uh, you know, when I became a probation officer, I remember the um, in the interview, they asked me what I do in my spare time and how do I balance work life. And I was like, I was first of all 21, but I thought this isn't important. You just need to hear how hard I'm gonna work and that I'm gonna, do whatever it takes to do this job. And I think as you get older, you realize self-care is extremely important. Um, so find that balance. Your work is, is your passion, it's your profession. You make a difference here, but that's only a portion of who you are. Make sure you hike or do yoga or music or whatever you find fun, but you need to find that balance. You need to remember if you're working in this field that um, not everything is crime related, not everyone is a criminal. And, and find that balance and, and make sure you take care of yourself. Resiliency, in order to snap back stronger and wiser, you really need to adapt to having um, practices in your life where you value um, self-care. And so whatever that is for you, I'd strongly encourage you to have and to really practice as a daily ritual. You know, I have had a lot of students tell me, you know, I don't need, I don't need experience. I don't need an internship. I'm going to have a four-year degree and I have a 4.0. And I always used to really cringe when I hear that statement and I still do because this is a very competitive field. Uh, I remember when I was a probation officer, I would get to help interview potential probation officers. And for one job, we might get a hundred applications. And and so it's not enough to just have your education. It's not enough to have a 4.0. I don't even remember looking at GPAs, you know, when we were, when we interview people, you need to bring something more to the table to be competitive. When you look at interviews, um, they're going to interview you with very direct questions. So if you don't really know about that job, you're not going to score high in that interview. And I'll give you an example. When I was a probation, when I was applying to become a probation officer many, many years ago, um, I had to write a case plan. So they gave me a person and they said, this is what this person has done. And this is what this person, um, you know, why they're in the system. How would you fix it? What would you do? Write a case plan. Had I not volunteered first and had my own exposure to case planning, I wouldn't have been able to answer that. And so, yes, we love you to have your education. Education is extremely important. I think it's, I mean, you'll never hear me say it's not, uh, but it's not enough. And so you need to get experience. So if you want to become a police officer, you know, they have explorers and cadet programs. They always run citizen academies in your neighborhood. Uh, probation has a deputy probation officer program. So any district that you work in usually takes interns. They train you exactly with the skills that you need to become a probation officer. Victim advocacy, 
uh, a lot of them are nonprofits. They love interns, uh, and so there's always opportunities to uh, gain experience through victim advocacy. The legal field, uh, there's the district attorney's office runs citizen academies where you can learn a great deal about what district attorneys do and what um, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis in, in our district attorneys or in the courts. Uh, the private firms are always open to taking interns. I place a lot of interns in private firms to work for attorneys. So gain experience, it's important. I also think as a person, it's important. If you're gonna spend a lot of money and time um, wanting to be a police officer, you get to become a police officer and you hate it, you've just wasted a lot of time and money. So intern, experience, do practicums, um, job shadow, do ride-alongs so that you can see for yourself whether or not this is the field for you. Be aware of criminal trends. I think this is really important and I know I keep saying everything's really important, but it is. Um, but, um, you know, people change, behaviors change, and we have to progress with that. It's not enough to know theories from 1900s. We need to know real information now in real time, and we have access to that. So, um, you know, I wrote some areas down that um, you, should, you should be more aware of. Um, human trafficking. I look back on my career and I think how many, before I even knew what ha human trafficking was and, and was trained in it, how many opportunities did I miss with clients where they might have been victims of human trafficking, um, where I wasn't able to identify a really serious component to that person's experiences um, that I do now because I'm aware and I'm trained in it. So human trafficking is the third largest criminal activity in the world. It's a $32 billion a year industry. It is something that you will probably become a, a you'll cross whether you're probation, parole, police, the jails, the prison system. And there's a lot you can do if your school doesn't offer anything about human trafficking. There's a, there are task force. Uh, I just realized there's an error on my slide, so I apologize. Uh, you, there's free trainings offered, so you know, be aware of that. Look it up online. There's tons of resources out there for you to learn more about. When you look at the advancement of technology, cybersecurity, counterintelligence, organized crime, uh, a really great resource for these areas are this FBI website. You can learn a great deal just even reading on the FBI website about these areas. Um, white collar crime, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it is going to make you more competitive and attractive to potential employers the more you know about different criminal trends. I hate the word opioid, so I'm sure I'm gonna mess it up, um, but looking at the opioid edemic, <laughs> epidemic, uh, a national survey on drug use and health report indicates that 116 people die daily from O opioid related overdoses, you know, and it's a $504 billion cost to the United States. You know, I, I'm recently back into the criminal justice field. Um, I started back in May of this year in, at the district attorney's office, and it is worse now than when I left the field 10 years ago. Um, the amount of heroin I see in our, uh, the heroin use and the heroin addiction is so big right now. And we criminalizing addiction isn't gonna help. Throwing them in jail and prison isn't going to help them. So knowing more about heroin or any drug for that matter and how we can help successfully rehabilitate people is crucial to this field and it makes you look competitive knowing those going in. We are very evidence-based practice now. So we look at what research has proven to work to be effective and we use those skills and strategies. And so an example is motivational inter interviewing. Uh, I would learn more about motivational interviewing. There's a book on it. <laughs> uh, there's probably lots of books on it. Um, but if your school offers it, I would learn that technique. Um, every single law enforcement organization I've worked for trains and looks for that skill in people, uh, professionals. Uh, when you look at cognitive behavioral therapies, there's a, a ton of therapies that you can learn, but you should learn them because it's important to know the strategies you're going to use to help really reform people and help them to rehabilitate. 
I know this is always in the news and we hear this a lot, especially with active shooters and school shooters, um, mental health interventions. Uh, you know, there's a book, I always quote a book, so if you've taken me before you know this, but um, Dutton wrote a book called The Psychological Profile of a Domestic Violence Offender. And he spoke a lot about trauma, um, abandonment, neglect, shame, abuse. Uh, and he said that it's a, a, a upper 90%. And I actually see that on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we need to know more about trauma and how it impacts the brain, how it impacts a person, how PTSD impacts a person. We can't change criminal behavior if we don't understand what's driving those behaviors. And so anything, any, any trainings you can get in mental health is, is really important. It makes you competitive um, when you're applying against 100 other people. So take a multi uh, multidisciplinary approach. Uh, learn more about accounting if that's your thing for white collar crime and cybersecurity. Uh, a lot of times when you're looking for someone on the run, uh, you trace it through money, their money. Uh, human services, law, mental health, forensics, make it a point to know more than just criminal justice. I um, cringe when students tell me, I have a four-year degree in criminal justice. I want to get my master's and my doctorates in it. And I think that's a bad move. I think you should, you should definitely have different disciplines with your criminal justice background mm -hmm. so that you can know more about the crimes in which people are committing, which always aren't necessarily just criminal justice ec education. You need to know about human resources, or human resources, human services or technology. Uh, so taking that multidisciplinary approach is really important. What I wanted to spend time talking about, because I love this topic, is in, um, Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman. Again, there are a lot of books written on it. If you go on to YouTube, you will definitely see, um, you'll definitely see videos on um, emotional intelligence. There are four realms of emotional intelligence that I'll talk about tonight. Self-regulation, self-awareness, motivation, social skills, and empathy. The thing I like about emotional intelligence, and I do teach um, on a regular basis, is you don't have to be born with it. These are skills that if you don't have them, you can become better at them. <clears throat> and they are essential in this field when you're working with maybe resistant clients who aren't really wanting to change their behaviors. When you look at self-regulation, that means the ability to manage emotions and impulses. Uh, there are going to be times you're dealing with someone who's screaming at you or yelling at you and uh, you're just gonna you're just gonna make it worse if you scream and yell back. And again, it's all about role modeling your behavior. You want to remote role model behaviors you want them to demonstrate equally. And so, being able to manage your own emotions and impulses are important. Um, it also can be life saving. You don't want to make a situation more dangerous for yourself. Uh, emotional intelligence can be about self regulation. Can be about conscientiousness, taking accountability for your actions and your performance. Uh, really being reflective, look at your work, how can you make it better, how can you become better as a professional, I think is really, really important. <clears throat> Again, if we're asking people to take accountability for their actions, we also need to be doing the same thing and role modeling that behavior. Adaptability is really important. Uh, there's a lot of change and flexibility. Uh, I don't think this happens enough in our field. I think that we could be far more innovative than we are, and people are very slow to change. <clears throat> and so the more you can handle change and flexibility, I absolutely believe it makes you more um, attractive in, in your skills when a professional is looking at hiring you. Innovation, uh, being open to new ideas, but also being that change catalyst. Uh, you know, I think in our field, we need people to be more innovative. Most of the assignments I give my students is create, uh, develop, discover. Uh, I don't want them just to know how prisons work. I want them to make prisons better. We know how prisons work and we know that they're not succeeding in, in working because of recidivism rates are around 67% to 75%. So instead of always blaming the offender, well, you know, the offender recidivated, it's his fault. We need to look as a system, what are we doing wrong that we have such a high recidivism rate? And so being able to bring something to the table, um, which are new ideas, innovation, and don't be afraid to do that. <clears throat> don't be afraid 
to say, you know what, we can make the system better and this is how. Even if people don't listen, keep telling them because it's important in this field and I don't think that um, we are anywhere where we should be as far as innovative um, practices go. Self-awareness, managing your own emotions effectively. Again, being reflective of your behaviors, um, being aware. Uh, I mean, if you're a supervisor in this field, or any field for that matter, you really should be aware of your own emotions and how that impacts your team. If you're a coworker um, and you're in a team, most of us are in teams in law enforcement, your emotions and your behaviors impact your team and the effectiveness of your team. So manage your emotions effectively. Be present, be mindful, um, really be the person people need to be effective in their field <clears throat> and, and, and alongside you. Motivation, um, if you're not motivated, then you're probably in the wrong career. Um, and I really do believe this, if you are not motivated in your career to look at making the system better, to spending the time to make the system better, um, you're probably in the wrong career. And students will say, I just, I wanna go into criminal justice, but I don't know what I wanna do. Uh, I, you know, and I always say, what does your heart tell you? What, what do you light up about when you think about what you wanna do in this, in this field? And I always strongly encourage them. Um, you know, I, um, I have my doctorates, <laughs> but I also have a son that I raised predominantly by myself. Um, I obtained my master's and my doctorates working uh, two jobs and raising a child. Um, if I didn't love this field and have the motivation for it, I don't know how I would have gotten through any of that. There are times during my doctoral research where I wanted to just throw my hands up and walk away. And it's that motivation that keeps you going. And uh, so it's that passion. So motivation is really important to have. It, it helps you set clear goals, uh, commitment and optimism. I bolded initiative because I think that's important. Um, one of the, I think the biggest things I see lacking in students that I used to get frustrated with as a teacher is initiative. Um, students kind of, well, they didn't teach that to me, so I never learned it. Have the initiative to know what you need to be taught and find that yourself. Don't rely on people to train you and just teach you. Go out there and seek it. If something doesn't work, fix it. If something doesn't um, seem like it's um, appropriate as far as a practice go change it um, find ways to you know be in, have initiative to make those changes on your own don't look to be told to do it do it because it matters to you it matters to the betterment of whatever you're doing I talked about this with written and verbal skills but it is a part of emotional intelligence you know and I won't say too much about it other than with social skills you know when you have the ability to have strong social skills you have the ability to communicate in teams, resolve conflict, negotiate. Uh, again, I really you know, see your job as, as influencing others for the better, to coach and mentor them, to understand and provide feedback without getting defensive, uh, to gain trust and establish rapport. If you don't have good social skills, you are going to struggle in this field. And so work on it, it's something you can, you can get better at um, and it's something you should always be mindful of, especially because uh, this is just an area that, again, can help you be better in your field. I like to, I saved empathy for last because I think it's the most important. Having compassion, I believe, is so underrated and it is yet so powerful in our field. You know, we were from a criminal justice system where we're, we were created in retribution, um, nail and jail them, punishment, uh, punishment is the way to go. And I mean, through decades <laughs> of research, that isn't the way to go. We need to be more progressive in how we help people. And so empathy is really important. Um, you have to understand where a person's at. You have to meet them where they're at. I was talking to a student I used to have, and now he's a probation officer. And today he said that. He said, you have to meet people where they're at. Um, and that was just, you know, just warming to my heart to hear him say that. But, um, you know, being compassionate and understanding that people are broken. People are in this field for a reason. People are addicted to drugs for a reason. It's not our job to judge them. Uh, and compassion can go a very long way. No, I'm not saying you have to, 
you know, hold hands and sing Kumbaya. And I'm not, I'm not at all suggesting that. But I think that to have a judgmental stance that we punish everyone who commits a crime hasn't worked. And we need to think differently. We need to think about other skills that we have to help people. And compassion is one venue that is very powerful and very effective. So when I was thinking about, <clears throat> when I wrote this, um, I, was, I felt like something was missing. I'm like, what am I missing in, in everything I want to tell people about competitive qualifications? So I was asking people around the office, uh, what, what would you say? If, if someone were to say, what skills should you have coming into this field? What would you say? And as I was um, at questioning people, Bishop came into um, our office. And if you're familiar with Denver probation, diversion, pretrial, um, you pretty probably know Bishop. And um, I asked Bishop, I said, <clears throat> if you could ask anybody, or if you could give advice to anybody about what qualifications they should have in this field, what would you tell them? And I loved his answer, but I have to, I didn't understand what he said, but um, I loved his answer. And um, so I thought I would share that with you tonight. He said, um, we need people who look at, treat people with their third thought. And so when he said that, I was like, what do you mean by that? We need to, pe we need to treat people um, with our third thought. And he said, initially, you know, in, in community corrections, we look at a person and we might judge them. They're a criminal, they're a drug addict, they're a child abuser, whatever. We may have a very judgmental stance, and I hope we don't, but we're human. Um, but that's our first thought, is they're in trouble, they're a gang member. Uh, um, and then our second thought is once we get to know them a little bit better, we start to see them less as a criminal and we start to see them as a human being. We see their strengths, their qualities. Um, we see their potential to get out of the situations in which they're in. And as you continue to work with that person, which we're, we're lucky as diversion officers, probation, parole officers, we're lucky to work with people on an ongoing basis, that we can get to that third thought, which is comprehensively knowing a person and seeing and understanding who they are, the, the whole person, um, I think is really important. Understanding their fears, their vulnerabilities, their traumas, you begin to see them as a person. And so I love uh, the advice he gave me, and it was a good refresher to me, that we really should see people with our third dot. So in other words, be less judgmental and really see the humanness in a person. Um, the more you do that, the more they're willing to trust you and establish that rapport. And that can be challenging at times. Uh, when I think about Bishop, I mean, it's just a great segue into passion because his passion is is just contagious and you can see it and it makes you more passionate even in his presence and so you know it, it's really about doing the things that you have enthusiasm about that you have drive about um, we have what's called in motivational interviewing the writing reflex and what the writing reflex says is we people who are in the criminal justice system criminal justice system as professionals, we have just a natural reflex to make things right or to want to make things right. And that comes from your passion. And so having that energy makes you more creative and, and makes you want to do this job. There are days when you scratch your head and you think, am I in the right field? And it's that passion that brings you home to say, yep, I am. And change is slow and people are scared to change, but you know what? Tomorrow's a new day and I'm going to try something different. Um, and so don't undervalue your passion. Really reflect on your passion and see where is that passion so that you, um, so that you bring that to the table. I love to interview people or work with students where they have a lot of passion towards this field. It's just a lot of energy, a lot of positive energy. You see people become solution-based um, more than just focus on problems. And um, it's a great, again, it's a great form of expression for other people to see and learn from you, whether you're a supervisor, an officer, um, it's a really great, um, you know, don't undervalue how much passion means in this field, I guess is what I'm saying. So with that being said, um, I know I kind of talked a lot and I talked your ear off and I hope that I've given you some important information. But with that being said, um, I'd like to open this up for questions. 
So Rebecca, thank you. Thank you very much. Super, uh, super insights. Uh, obviously, um, you know, very impressive background and, and very lucky to have you in the field with, with uh, you know, your perspective. Um, and, and I know we do have a, a, you know, do have time for a few, uh, a few questions just to close out some of the uh, things we talked about. And just as a reminder uh, to anyone listening, um, feel free to submit questions. There's a Q&A button right at the top of your Zoom. Um, so feel free if you have any questions, just to submit them in that format and I'll monitor, uh, monitor that. Uh, you know, until uh, until we close out uh, in about 15 minutes. But Rebecca, just just a couple of questions here to to um, you know to follow up on a few things. Um, I know you you talked a lot about the uh, the skills um, uh, you know needed, uh, the specific skills, soft skills, hard skills, um, and and a lot of those points resonated uh, uh, with me um, very intimately. What would you say if you were to pick one? You know that that students could could focus on. Um, you know, one skill that, that, you know, you see that, that criminal justice professionals are lacking, you know, right at this moment, you know, on, on Thursday, uh, Thursday. Mm -hmm. I would say innovation. Um, as much as there's a part of criminal justice who has very innovative workers, especially younger people, uh, I know we, we uh, give millennials a hard time. They're valuable to this field. Bringing, looking at a system and changing it uh, will, and be willing to change ways in which we've done things for a very long time. Being creative, looking out, you know, outside of the box and, and being really solution based in that innovation and how can we make the system better. I think it's such an asset uh, this field and I wish we had more of it. Um, there are times when Practices that are very old, and I wonder why are we still doing this? We know it doesn't work, and so being innovative, being up on research and trends is, is really important. I think that's probably my one of my top skills. Yeah, and I think that you know it's it's so true because criminal justice traditionally, I mean, when you talk about other industries, uh, you know, business and accounting and and IT, you know, they're they're built on innovation, right? And criminal justice mm -hmm. is really not. You know, it's it's based on tradition and uh, following the path, uh, kind of that that we know. So I think that's uh, that's a very good point. Um, you know, for students maybe to focus on ways to like, like you you know you mentioned very alarming statistic about the recidivism rate. You know, sixty seven to seventy five percent. So obviously, right. You know, we need to do something different. Um, you know, and how do we do that? Obviously, not doing the same thing we've been doing, right? So right. focus on that innovation. Um, so great, um, you know, great insights there. So, so le leading in, you know, into that, what do you see as, as the, you know, you talked about this uh, a little bit on with your focus area, talking about cyber crime and human trafficking. What, what do you think is the, the you know, in, in your circle, uh, you know, in, in the corrections, uh, probation uh, area, you know, what is the, the current trend that you're seeing uh, in that industry uh, today? And it could be trend of, of population coming in or or sentencing i mean do you see anything as as kind of jumping out at you that that kind of you wish you could just you know um that that either is going well or or that you could improve but but just something that's you know just just really current right now homelessness it is you know i've left the field i left the field in 2009 as a probation officer and i started teaching full-time in just may of this year and um, I have been so shocked at the amount of homelessness mm -hmm. in Denver. And um, I mean, every single client I have struggles with homelessness and uh, you just see it in the jails. They have no, nowhere to go. Uh, I really believe we have to do more. Um, resources are to the, I mean, they're maxed out. Every shelter is maxed out. Every time you go look for places to help transition into housing there's waiting lists um, you're asking people who are addicted to drugs to stay in shelters where there's nothing but drugs in them uh, we really need to really look at how do we help people not be homeless anymore uh, I mean it goes alongside with mental illness to take care of their basic needs we can't ask them to do community service and therapy and treatment if they're worried about where they're gonna sleep at night kind of back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So one of the biggest concerns I've had and that I've actually taken a step back and started looking at how can we better our system is how do we help them with housing and, and being homeless? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, as we continue to focus on these areas and, and you know, you, so, so you mentioned some of the skills potentially needed, right, um, for, for students. You, you know, you talked a little bit about the, the verbal, the communication uh, aspects to focus on. So if you were to predict, you know, take a time machine five, 10 years from now, um, you know, what, what do you think would be the skills that would be needed? And I mean, these, we might not even know what these are now, but in just kind of where you sit, you know, you, you know you've had a, obviously a very credentialed history uh, in the, or experience in this, in this field. So if you were to just take that and move forward, where do you think if we were to have this discussion in, in you know, five or 10 years, what do you think, you know, what would you say is the skill set that will be needed uh, at that point? Yeah, soft skills. You know, um, you know, technology is going to continue to advance. And, you know, there's a lot of studies that show that we can't compete with technology. If we had rob, um, robots or that type of artificial intelligence, we can't compete with their knowledge. Um, and so areas in which we can compete is our soft skills, our compassion, our ability to be decent human beings. Um, you know, I, I just think we we need to really make sure the communication skills, the empathy, um, the focus on heart-driven leaders um, is probably even more significant 10 years from now where the ability to communicate uh, are skills I think I would still stay focused. And I, I do believe that we still should stay focused in technology and know the advancements and stay up with it, um, most definitely. But I, I, th I, I wonder how much um, we're going to compromise our ability to be empathetic and compassionate and have social skills as we advance with technology. So I would say that focus on those soft skills um, is important now. And I think in 10 years, it'll be even more important. All right. So I, I understand. So, so you're, you're saying the, we, we should, uh, we should leverage technology, but not just solely rely on it. In other words, yeah. so use it as mm -hmm. a tool, but not the, the first layer It should be kind of the, you know, something we, we um, refer to, but not rely on, in other words. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, how about some of the, you know, and, and we, we, you know, talk about this in some of our courses, um, and, and our students uh, love to hear about these things. Speaking of technology, what are some of the, you know, the cool things that they're, they're using in corrections now, um, you know, that they didn't, let's say, 10 years ago, um, as far as, um, you know, monitoring and, um, you know, uh, you know, just maintaining a caseload. I mean, what, how are they leveraging technology now on a, on a um, you know, a caseload or even just on a broader scale in corrections in general that, that let's say they didn't before? You know, I, I mean, there's definitely better technology and surveillance. Um, when you think about GPS and our ability to monitor sobriety or location of a person, um, I really love the advancements we've made in technology there. If you look at GPS, um, global positioning satellites, if you put on a, a person on a bracelet and we monitor them, if they get too close to their victim, that victim can be notified. Mm. Um, the police are notified, so there's a, in cases where there's a protection order, um, that would be really important. Um, you know, it's interesting, when I left the field, we didn't have cell phone usage as much as we do now. And uh, now that I'm back in the field, the cell phone is really important. Mm. Um, you can text your clients anywhere you're at. Um, it's easier to keep contact with them. Um, you know, there's just an exchange of information that can happen right away. You don't walk into your office and have 75 voicemails because you now can communicate on a cell phone. You have to be very conscientious of leaving work at work and not, not going home and working all night with emails and text messages. But um, even the ability to use social media, um, there have been times when you want to know what your clients are up to when they're not with you, uh, which is almost all the time. Um, people, it's always shocking to me how much people will put on their social media accounts uh, when you're looking at trying to help them better themselves. Um, just looking at some of the social media posts that they have um, is a great way to monitor your clients even more than you already do. Uh, we, I mean, we have technology to monitor sobriety. We have RAM, so they wear a bracelet um, around their neck, uh, not their neck, <laughs> around their mm -hmm. ankle, and um, it monitors um, how much um, alcohol they might be using. Uh, all of that is, is, is very helpful for us. Eye scanning, so people who can't do urine screens, 
who don't want to do urine screens um, can have their eyes scanned uh, so we can monitor sobriety. DNA, the fact that, you know, DNA is to identify the the person who committed the crime. Now it can identify a, a family line. So maybe we don't have the person who committed the crime. We have the DNA that says, hmm, it's not this guy, but it's someone in his family lineage is, is amazing. I'm always shocked with forensics, how much technology is there to help us um, solve crimes. I'm so sorry, just so you know, I uh, I have a conference room and um, just as we started, someone came and shut off all the lights. <laughs> so if I look black and white and I look like I'm in the dark, it's because I am. <laughs> I tried to move around to get the lights to work and they're not, so I didn't prepare for that, so I apologize. No, no problem. And then we're almost out of time. We only have a, a, a couple more minutes anyway. So I think we have time for one more real quick, uh, real quick question. So I'll go to the chat box. Um, so, Rebecca, do you think the criminal justice system is more about perpetuating and sustaining itself uh, as an industry and less inclined to resolve incidents of criminality and recidivism? Wow, that's a great question. Mm. That's a tough one for just a minute, isn't it? Or so. <laughs> it is. I mean, there's a part of me, and I'll, I'll be really honest, and I hope I don't really offend anyone. Uh, when you look at the private field, when you think of pri private prisons, my biggest fear and a lot of research shows that there might be times when we're incarcerating people to keep numbers um, so that they have enough money for beds. Um, I'm always afraid when we privatize uh, criminal justice professions, what the um, intent is, um, you know, to perpetuate that. You know, you see that in private community corrections facilities. Um, and so I, I don't, I'm not, I'm never going to sit here and say that it doesn't happen. I believe it does. Um, I get, that would go back to that accountability piece is holding ourselves accountable as a system so that doesn't happen. We're dealing with people's lives and we don't have any right whatsoever to continue cycles for our own advantage of just keeping a system going. Um, we could better our system differently um, and, you know, without kind of canceling ourselves out, but become more effective. And so I hope I answered it. I, I want to say that, yes, I think that there are instances and there's examples that we do that. Um, I definitely don't condone it on any level. And I think that that's where I really strongly encourage people to get into the field and be solution based and really target those entities that might be doing that uh, so that we no longer um, use people in that way or exploit people. Fantastic. And I think we're just about out of time. Rebecca, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the, the Q&A and, and for the session. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for your time and your insight. And everybody, this concludes our Enlightening Talks for tonight. A huge thank you to Rebecca, our speaker, for our time and participation. Thank you to all our viewers for joining us. We hope you found the conversation informative and useful in your work. Uh, you can register for upcoming Enlightening Talks uh, from our webpage, which is csuglobal.edu slash enlightening-talks.